introduction to that tension between how do you resist a violent apartheid state when you are persistently coming up against very high levels of violence. But if your inclinations were still as was and is mine mm. to continue to embrace the power of nonviolence uh, as a way of resisting um, injustice uh, was always there from an early age. And then, you know, as the struggle in South Africa in the late 80s intensified and more and more young people, including many close friends of mine and even myself as a underground member of the Mandela's movement, had to confront the issue that even though I was not engaged in armed struggle myself, that I was part of a movement that actually engaged in it. So there were four pillars in the South African struggle, mass mobilization, international solidarity, the political underground, and armed struggle. So I was involved in basically three of the four. It wasn't fashionable at all to say, you know, I'm for nonviolence, but it is something that in most of all that we did really was in the space of civil disobedience and, and nonviolence. It's important to understand when Mandela advocated for armed struggle, firstly, he did it very reluctantly. Secondly, it was with deep regret. But also, it was particularly focused on how do you prevent worse-scale, anarchic, sporadic violence. Uh, I was brought up as a Hindu and 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 uh, said that Hinduism is not the best religion. And my mother said, you know, the only religion you need is to see God in the eyes of every human being that you meet, right? And focus on the weaknesses in yourself and focus in the strengths of others because you might be some be able to do something about the weaknesses in yourself you're never going to be able to do something uh, about the weaknesses in others because those weaknesses can only be addressed when those people decide within their hearts and souls that they want to change. Sadly, my mom committed suicide two years after she told me that at the age of 38 and I was 15. But it's a wisdom personally I have carried through, throughout my life and I have found it to be a very beautiful wisdom. So what my message to young people is, twofold. The first is, in this moment of history, where we live, that we find ourselves in, pessimism is a luxury we simply cannot afford. That the pessimism of our analysis can best be overcome by the creativity of our thought, our action, and our courage. The second message to young people is, it is not too late to turn things around. And don't underestimate how broken things currently are. And because things are as broken as they are, economic system, virtually all our systems are crumbling, right? In this brokenness is the best time for progressive, alternative, transformative ideas to emerge. In a polarized world, how do you do big systemic change? Yeah. Right? You've got to recognize that the approach of activism itself must change. Right? That demonizing the enemy or those that hold different views from you, right, and making them a permanent enemy is not a smart thing to do. One of the things we learned during the anti-apartheid struggle was what helps you move forward is by understanding there's a people's camp and there's an oppressor camp, right? Those that want to maintain the status quo and perpetuate injustice. And that good activism is about constantly saying, you know, if you have the working class here, you have the middle class here, you have the bourgeoisie there, from all of them, how do you get more and more of them to veer towards 
the people's camp. 